Hey guys, welcome to my channel. I hope you're all doing very well. So I just watched What If episode 4. Let's talk about it. So I just spent the last two hours yapping, yapping, yapping on about Cinderella. <laughs> Literally of all things talking about Cinderella. Um, you guys should see that video come up at some point. <laughs> at some point. It's going to be so long to edit. Oh, it's going to be so long. Why was I talking for so long? I'm doing it again. Oh, I need to stop myself. But yeah, that's what my week has been like uh, so far. How's your week been? You know, I always say I hope you guys are doing well, but I never get a chance to ask you, like, how are you doing? Let me know. I'd love to uh, chat with you guys down in the comments. Um, and also, you know, this is just going to be an informal review of uh, What If Episode 4. I even forgot what I was going to talk about for a second there. You know, this is yet another edition of Late Night Reviews, but really really like it's not an addition if it keeps happening <laughs> like it's not limited edition if it's always sold so like yeah but we're just going to be chatting about what if episode four now what's interesting about what if so far is that it seems as though people have had mixed feelings and different views on what have been the best and worst episodes. When I review each episode, it seems as though different people say that that episode is their favorite or least favorite. And so it's been really interesting to see how people have reacted to the episodes um, as they come out each week. But having said that, surely we can agree, at least most of us can agree, that episode four was the best so far. Like sure, surely we're on the same page about that <laughs> surely we're on the same page episode four that explores the question of what if zombies like that's literally just all that it says what if zombies which i think is genius like it sells itself surely we can all agree that this was the best or at least the top three best episodes of what if so far we're going to be diving into my thoughts on the episode as a whole but as per usual if you haven't already please be sure to subscribe to my channel and make sure you turn on your notifications so that you can be told when i upload next now without further ado let's just let's have our little chat so first of all the beginning of the episode starts off with familiar scenes that we saw in avengers infinity war where bruce banner ends up smack bang in the middle of the sanctum sanctorum having torn through the roof and he lands on the staircase muttering the words thanos is coming <laughs> thanos is coming and this was of course something that we saw in the live action film where bruce had just fallen from the skies after having been ambushed along side Thor, Loki and the rest of the Asgardians by Thanos. So he came down to warn everyone about what was going to happen but ultimately he was a little too late. They didn't get enough warning and Thanos's children quickly made an appearance and that's something that we see at the beginning of this episode but there are a few tweaks. First of all in the live action movie we saw Bruce be met by Doctor Strange and by Tony Stark in like that iconic trio sequence. Like we were all or losing our minds like oh my god Tony Stark is talking to Doctor Strange ah like fangirling like crazy right but this doesn't happen this time around because he's all on his own and then when Bruce finally manages to find clothes to cover himself with this time around instead of wearing more modern clothing which he was likely supplied by um, Doctor Strange instead he's wearing this kind of uniform that we see Wong wear and indeed um, with some of the other sorcerers in Doctor Strange um, also wear this um, kind of uniform and then he heads out onto the street where we expect him to be met with like busy chaos madness all around but instead he's just met with this deathly silence like it's just completely quiet the streets are barren there isn't a single person to be seen until of course we have the arrival of the black order Thanos's children and we have Ebony Moore start off with his whole soliloquy about how it's an honor to be killed by Thanos's children but he's talking to no one because <laughs> the streets of New York are empty and eerily so but still the Black Order don't stop they see a living person and they head straight towards Bruce Banner and Bruce Banner is getting ready to Hulk up okay gear up the Hulk but just like we saw in Avengers Infinity War the Hulk is like 
like on a hiatus is that what bruce says <laughs> the hulk is on a sabbatical okay and just like in infinity war he refuses to come out he even says like no when you can see the green kind of pulsing through bruce and you can see that kind of tumultuous relationship that the hulk and bruce had in avengers infinity war play out at the beginning of this episode so at this moment in time bruce is thinking like oh damn like i'm finished <laughs> like i'm screwed like the hulk doesn't want to come out i'm all on my own here well it turns out he's not alone after all because we do see the entry of some heroes who are ready to take down the members of the black order but just as bruce is celebrating he's like yes tony stark is here yes dr strange is here yes wong is here woo like this is my gang these are my people they're ready to come help defend the earth but then things get a little bit weird because tony stark starts eating ebony moore <laughs> like tony stark starts eating people and you're, you're thinking hmm okay and bruce is like this is a bit of an overkill but you know maybe he's just getting a bit excited because these are thanos's kids and this is a big deal but no we quickly realize that this isn't just because tony's hungry it's because tony's a whole ass zombie and this is like the best reveal ever <laughs> now obviously we already saw in the title of the episode that this is going to be the zombie episode but it was still great to see the big reveal of tony turning around revealing that he is in fact a zombie he looks like so gruesome and ugly his skin all torn apart and i will say you know i've been praising the animation every single week um throughout my reviews of this series but i love the way that they kind of recreated the marvel zombies from the comics using this animation style i think it's very effective i wonder how children reacted to it because it's not the most terrifying thing in the world but it is definitely effective and the image is definitely imprinted in my mind now as i mentioned this episode is in inspired by the Marvel Zombies comic series that was by Robert Kirkman. Now if that name sounds familiar to you that's because you may have heard me praise Robert Kirkman's other creation in the form of Invincible. <laughs> in the form of Invincible. Like my guy is clearly a genius. Like truly he is doing some incredible things. Invincible is amazing. Invincible is everything okay but now we have this episode that is inspired by his work in Marvel comics and like it's one of the best episodes episodes of the series so like clearly the guy is onto something clearly he knows what he's doing okay and I also find it interesting how this episode ended up being the most violent the most gruesome they did not hold back in the slightest and I've been saying about how impressed I have been by the action sequences in these animated um, episodes because these characters are animated you can go the extra mile to really demonstrate their prowess on the battlefield but in the case of this episode it was particularly gruesome it was another style of action that we often see in zombie movies <laughs> that this episode very much paid homage to and I feel like again the fact that it has that Robert Kirkman sort of essence to it sort of spice to it and seeing what became of the animated uh, series Invincible over at Amazon Prime I wouldn't be surprised if this gruesomeness stems from the comics and how he portrays the violence of that but just as the undead are about to turn towards Bruce as he's the only living being in proximity with them along comes spider-man who ends up being the star of this episode surprisingly now what's equally surprising is that he isn't actually voiced by tom holland in this episode he's actually voiced by an actor called hudson thames who i think does a good approximation of tom holland's peter parker but still i would have thought that of all of the actors tom holland would be first in line to voice the animated version of the character maybe it's because he's technically technically a Sony property and Sony had something to say no no because Sony liked the fact that they're affiliated with the MCU <laughs> like it's a godsend to them but as I said Spider-Man and his gang swing in to help Bruce fight against his former teammates and then they end up going to their secret hideout which turns out to be these trains that are suspended by Spider-Man's webs in like the middle of the sky <laughs> the middle of the New York skyline because truly we are in the zombie apocalypse here okay desperate times call for desperate measures and speaking of being in the zombie apocalypse spider-man is even filming this at home video this kind of instructional video on how to survive the zombie apocalypse in the mcu 
this episode just goes for it like it fully commits to the idea that these mcu characters are in a zombie apocalypse and so you have these oddballs working together in order to survive it you see happy hogan who's introduced here as a sort of prop <laughs> as a sort of actor for this uh video that peter is making although to which crowd we don't know because the city seems to be desolate but happy is wearing this t-shirt that's so hilarious he's like i'm saving myself for thor or something which is so funny and then we're also introduced to kurt from the ant-man films who is also inexplicably in this episode like of all of the characters if you had asked me like which character would be plucked from an ant-man movie in order to be featured in what if i would have said like michael peña's character from the film or something but the fact that we have david del smalchian's kurt in this episode is kind of inexplicable and like also quite funny but yeah he's here and he's yapping on about baba yaga as her usual which i find hilarious and each time i hear baba yaga of course i think of keanu reeves <laughs> i think of keanu reeves okay so i was half expecting a crossover <laughs> between john wick and the mcu in this film every time he mentioned that legend and then next we're introduced to bucky barnes who's like taking a shower and i'm sure a bunch of bucky stands were like dying dying at that scene <laughs> wishing it was live action okay but he is voiced again by sebastian stan here i do feel like he was funny and had a bit more use in this episode in comparison to his appearance in episode one where I felt like he was largely wasted and I also liked seeing this version of Bucky who has like the longer hair and he's post Winter Soldier and he's working with Peter Parker which is in large contrast to his interaction with Peter in Captain America Civil War. We also have the return of Sharon Carter and my girl, my girl, <laughs> my girl General Okoye absolutely deny Guerrero absolutely always a win always a win. oh look at the smile on my face always a win so I really like this ragtag team they have going on it's full of these like unexpected people but at the same time their chemistry works so you do enjoy following this story along with them but they are out on a mission to try and find the cure to this zombieism that has plagued the earth and they do find this lead which would take them to Camp Lehigh I believe it's pronounced all this time I thought it was Camp Lee but maybe I just wasn't reading it properly <laughs> it's Camp Lehigh which is where Steve actually did his um training um when he was becoming a soldier in Captain America the first Avenger and we saw him return there in Captain America the Winter Soldier where we found Armin Zola and all of his computerized glory but this time around it seems as though someone over there has managed to find a cure for this zombieism so the gang have to make their way over there they end up in Grand Central Station in New York where another action sequence takes place with other members of the Avengers including the Falcon, Hawkeye, you know all of these zombified Avengers which is quite heartbreaking to see but also again this episode is just so violent that the characters don't hesitate when they kill the Avengers because yes they're out here killing Avengers. Bucky is out here killing Sam Wilson because he's a zombie and he's not even feeling that bad about it which like I took issue with okay <laughs> i was like guys we just watched a whole series about how you guys became besties now you want to tell me bucky doesn't care when he's shooting up sam like I, th that's offensive to me and i know that they're not at the same stage of their friendship um as they are in the main mcu canon but still like because we just seen those characters bond together and bucky was invited to the cookout the fact that he like betrayed sam like that like yeah he's a he's a zombie but at least you can feel bad about it and we also have this classic scene where Peter has to use his webs on some trains we've seen this time and time again I think it was like in the original Spider-Man trilogy there was a scene where Peter had to like hold up a train with his like webs and that that was a very iconic scene um, and also as I mentioned um, they were hanging out in this like base that was suspended in the air by Peter's webs and I guess it was foreshadowing actually um, for the fact that he would need to use his webs in order to help operate the train that would take them to jersey and as happy says <laughs> one of the worst parts of the zombie apocalypse is the fact that they still need to go to new jersey and look i'm just an innocent londoner i've never really known why america but in particular new york hates new jersey <laughs> like i just i don't know why okay but i don't need to know because i agree <laughs> i've just been brainwashed and conditioned to think that new jersey is literally the worst place on 
up so they finally end up hopping on a train to jersey to get to camp lehigh except they did have a few casualties along the way with happy being turned into a zombie and also i believe sharon carter being turned into a zombie as well um and then you had um the wasp chipping in kind of going into sharon and then exploding her <laughs> like again this episode was just so gruesome like she literally became small got into sharon exploded her but then in the meantime also got this scratch which of course means that she is inevitably going to be heading towards the same direction as happy and sharon did and also during this trip to camp lehigh we do also see that signature moment that we saw in the trailers for what if and that is the appearance of zombie captain america and i <laughs> an icon for the ages and we do see Bucky Barnes go against him with his gun you know and it's like I don't actually know why his gun was like the first port of call each time even though he knows the only way to kill the zombie for good is to chop off their heads like why are we bothering with the guns <laughs> they don't work but anyways we do see Bucky go against Steve and I think this kind of calls back to when Bucky and Steve were fighting on the same team on a train in a Captain America America, the first Avenger which ultimately led to Bucky's demise also Steve thoughts but this time around Steve is the one that's taken down so then the train ends up stopping in the middle of nowhere but just as Camp Lehigh is in sight it's literally within sight they end up seeing this horde of zombies blocking the way and so Hope knowing that her time is very limited okay she's about to turn into a zombie any second now decides to make the ultimate sacrifice and she turns back big just as Ant-Man did in um, Captain America Civil War I almost forgot that <laughs> I almost forgot what film I was talking about for a second there and um, she turns big and like stomps over the zombies again just like crushing them like truly this episode was so violent she crushes the zombies without remorse without hesitation in order to allow the gang to get to the camp and then ultimately she is overcome by the zombies who are like climbing over her legs oh it's horrible and also she turning into a zombie herself so she does make that ultimate sacrifice but not before telling Peter to smile because in this episode it really is hammered home about how much Peter has lost like and that's just separate from the episode itself but just in general within the MCU the character has lost his parents and Uncle Ben and Aunt May seemingly even though he forgets to mention it initially when he's going through the list of people that he has lost that were close to him um, and he's doing so after he's just recently lost Happy so alongside losing Tony Stark he also lost Happy who was Tony Stark's um, close friend and yeah it's just a really sad and emotional moment that Peter has um, on the train and you know Hope is there to hear this and so she kind of pays that forward um, when she does make the ultimate sacrifice by telling him to continue smiling because it is this question of you know how does Peter still have that hope how does he have that optimism within him when he's just lost so much and I feel like it's a really nice emotional through line that this episode has I wouldn't say that the episode has enough time I <sighs> This, these episodes are too short okay? <laughs> these episodes are too short like that's just the issue throughout but this episode certainly did not have enough time to pay that storyline justice fully like it's there it's sprinkled throughout the episode but it just it doesn't have time to really let us settle with it to really let us sit with it before we have to move on to the next action sequence with the zombies but when they do finally make it to Camp Lehigh they do notice that all of the zombies that are lined up by the gates Seem to be like paws they're physically not capable of going into the camp and we later find out it's because vision has developed this kind of <laughs> yada 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 technology science blah 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 listen <laughs> vision did a science and was able to use the mind stone in order to manipulate the zombies minds so that they um won't go into the the camp so that's why they're not able to go into the camp and then the gang actually meets Vision and he seems a bit shifty. The second that I saw Vision, that first of all I thought, man, they really made him look like Paul Bettany. I think it's funny how the series has chosen which characters to make look exactly like their um, live action counterparts and which characters who look just completely different. In the case of Vision, he looks like Paul Bettany's Vision. I would also say that Hank Pym looked like Michael Douglas 
Lois in episode three. Um, but then there are other characters who just look completely different, like Natasha Romanoff, who didn't look really um, like um, uh, Scarlett Johansson. Um, and also Hope Van Dyne didn't really look like Evangeline Lilly, even though she was voiced by her. So yeah, like they definitely pick and choose. <laughs> so Vision takes the gang into the camp in order to show them the operations that he has created using the Mind Stone. And we see that he is utilizing the technology that Armin Zola in the main MCU canon um, had used in order to keep himself alive. But he has adapted these computers in order to send out this signal so that the zombies can you know, not interfere with the camp somehow. Again, like yada, 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 fine science. <laughs> it all seems to be going swimmingly, especially when the gang see that he managed to cure Scott. Now, Scott was actually one of the original victims of this zombification because it turns out that this all started in the Ant-Man universe. <laughs> this is all Ant-Man's fault, or more specifically Hank Pym's fault, because when he went into the quantum realm to find his wife, Janet Van Dyne she was already a zombie when he discovered her in the quantum realm and this had been caused by a virus within the quantum realm that had infected her brain and caused her to become a zombie again science science so then he um, escaped from the quantum realm and ultimately started spreading this zombie virus and then we see um, the Avengers try to intervene and you know they're powerful and they're coming in with all their might except they become the perfect vector for the virus in order to continue spreading because of course they are powerful and they are able to travel far distances but then when we meet Scott once again we do see that he is just this head <laughs> which reminded me of Futurama because I've been re-watching the entirety of Futurama for the last year so that definitely reminded me of Futurama and seeing Scott as just a head trapped in this jar and cursed to make these cringy but hilarious dad jokes was really funny to me <laughs> and then on top of that you have the fact that he was definitely like a hundred percent unmistakably voiced by Paul Rudd. Now Bucky having served as the Winter Soldier for many many decades has his own spidey senses <laughs> so he wanders off um, into some of the abandoned rooms in the camp where he finds honestly one of the most distressing scenes that I've ever seen in the whole MCU and that is a T'Challa who's sitting on this like makeshift bed and he has a whole leg missing when I tell you I was shocked and angered and confused I was like what is going on? what King T'Challa who did this who did this they need to pay immediately but yes T'Challa is lying there and it very much mirrors how Bucky um, was found by Steve in Captain America the first Avenger after Hydra experimented on him before he ended up falling off of the mountain and that's kind of um, the supposed reason for how he ended up surviving that is because he already had some of the serum in him to begin with but yes for Fast forwarding to the series of events here, we see T'Challa um, with his, well, part of his leg missing. And I'm thinking like, what the hell is going on? And at first I was offended. I was like, who allowed this to happen to the Black Panther? And this wasn't even addressed towards the characters in the episode. Like I was talking directly through the screen to the writers, how dare you? But it turns out that this actually happens in the comics. Um, it turns out that in the comics, uh, T'Challa is also captured, except this time around by Hank Pym and Hank Pym does feed off of T'Challa's body in the comics again incredibly gruesome in the comics it's actually worse because he loses more of his other limbs so we do see a reference to that be played out in this episode with T'Challa um, having lost part of his leg except this time around it turns out that Vision was using him as feed for Wanda and Wanda is in this like glass container I'm sure it's reinforced and she has also been zombified which is like the worst case scenario like it's all fun and games when ant-man gets zombified like who cares but wanda <laughs> <laughs> that is a problem but despite the fact that we have seen these characters kill off their um, teammates without hesitation because they were zombified throughout the entirety of this episode it seems as though Vision the one android the one non-human character to begin with cannot bring himself to do the same to Wanda his love and that kind of ties into the events of WandaVision where we saw the opposite um, come about where Wanda would do anything to keep Vision alive 
alive. This time around, Vision will do anything to keep Wanda alive, including feeding a king to her, whatever. Anyway, so then Bucky helps T'Challa up and he's the one to reveal this information to everyone and everyone turns to Vision with suspicion, rightfully so. But it turns out that the damage has already been done because Bucky had the audacity to shoot at the glass container keeping Wanda and so she manages to release herself and then chaos ensues or should I say chaos magic <laughs> then there's yet another action sequence that actually ends up mirroring the action sequence from Captain America Civil War which is interesting I think it was a kind of mirror of the um, action sequence that takes place at the airport where the Avengers are fighting against one another but in this episode Peter T'Challa and Scott are trying to make their way to some sort of satellite so they can broadcast the uh, signal that's caused by the Mind Stone so that it can be a cure for zombieism all around yada yada science science and we do actually see Vision sacrificing the Mind Stone that is in the middle of his forehead um, just as we saw it be removed from him in Avengers Infinity War by Thanos this time around he does it himself and the same result happens where he turns all grey and he dies but the gang are planning on using that in order to find a cure for the rest of the world and so just when you think you're gonna have a happily ever after in one of these what if episodes we do have that final moment <laughs> where zombie Thanos has arrived on earth and he has all of the other infinity stones the only one that's missing is the mind stone echoing the events of Avengers Infinity War once again so two things here first of all it's interesting how this episode mashed up events from various um, MCU movies just as the other episodes of the series have done previously but the fact that the action sequence was so clearly taken from um, Captain America Civil War was quite fascinating to me but also you have the fact that as I mentioned in my review of last week's episode all of these episodes so far have had unhappy endings like I can't believe it took me this long to realize but this is yet another instance where things are looking quite bad by the end of the episode and so again it just keeps us engaged for what's to come later and hopefully we'll be able to see the second parts of all of these storylines play out um, during this series and if not in this season then perhaps in the second season coming but that's it from me now that I told you guys my thoughts on what if episode four it's time for you guys to let me know what you thought of this episode down in the comments below please be sure to subscribe to catch you videos coming up thank you guys so so much for watching I really really appreciate it and I will see you in the next one bye